Hello, everyone, and welcome back to the Mentor Nation podcast. It's your host, John Abbas here, and I'm very excited to announce that we are finally, as you can see right here, this is my podcast studio, which is my dining room, but we are building a custom home right now, and I will be building a brand new podcast studio in there, so I'm very excited about that. I get to pick the designs. It won't be ready until March, so we have a little bit of time, but I want to welcome you back to the show. And today, guys, I have a very, very, very special guest for you. And before I bring him on, I just want to ask you guys for a huge favor. You know, if you are watching this interview on YouTube, the YouTube channel for the Mentor Nation podcast is pretty new, and so it would mean a lot to me if you just took five seconds, just subscribe. It takes literally no time at all, and you'll always be updated when new episodes release. If you are listening to this interview, um, just hit the subscribe so that you're also alerted. I have some really incredible guests lined up over the next few weeks, and I just want you to be updated whenever those episodes release. Just the guests that I have coming are incredible, and today is no exception. And I'm not even kidding. When I got finished with this interview, I was just moved. It was one of the greatest interviews that I've ever had. And, and I don't just mean because of his massive success, you know, as you will see, but it's his humility and gratitude and his genuine desire to help people and make their lives better that just made this interview incredible. Peter Totten is Literally, to me, I think he has one of America's greatest success stories. While he was a young racquetball player striving to work his way up to become pro, he spent a lot of time in gyms all over the country. And so, you know, spending so much time in gyms, this gave him an idea of what worked, what didn't work, what gym was welcoming, customer service, things like that. And one day, he saw a gym that he believed in, but it just wasn't doing well, and he knew it. And he approached the owners, and he told them, he's like, guys, listen, if you ever want to turn this gym around, give me a call. And <laughs> they didn't call him right away, but a year later, they gave him a call, and Peter came on board to a gym that was losing $200,000 per year. And he came on with a measly salary of $16,000 per year, which you can imagine. It's like $8 an hour. Now, through hard work, focus, and customer service, he took that one gym and he turned it into one of the largest gym franchises on earth. He created Snap Fitness and he grew it to 2,500 locations in 26 countries. And he didn't even stop there. He founded Lyft Brands, which started developing and acquiring other brands adjacent to Snap Fitness. And so they ventured into other areas of fitness, which consisted of companies like Nine Round Fitness, Ferrell's Yoga Fit, Steel Fitness, and Fitness On Demand, which grew to more than 6,000 locations all over the world. Peter is often considered the Michael Jordan of the fitness franchise world. Today, with a nine-figure net worth, Peter focuses much of his time on philanthropy, passion projects, and helping other entrepreneurs. In this interview, Peter shares his story, his greatest lessons, and his advice for those of you listening who are on your own path to success. It's just an honor to have him on. Please help me welcome Peter Totten. Peter, I just want to say thank you for being on the Mentor Nation podcast. It is great to have you on today, and I'm excited for this interview. No, thanks. I've been looking forward as well. You know, I, I look forward to these type of, of interviews where you get down and get into the weeds about how do you grow a company and how do you, how do you maintain your sanity. So I'm uh, excited <laughs> to be here today. Yeah, absolutely. And, I, you know, it's, it's powerful that you devote time to giving back like this. Um, it's just, I think that's, it's really awesome. Like that you take the time and you're jumping on podcasts when you've had the success that you've had. So again, thank you. And my, my goal today, man, we're going to, we're going to impact a lot of lives today. I was telling you a little bit before we got started, I was doing my own research um, and I was listening to you on another podcast and I just, I can't even tell you how much value that I got listening to one of your interviews, like the one that we're going to have today. And so I believe that after listening, 
probably the best way that we can serve the audience today is just by going through your story sure. and just pausing and reflecting on some of the pivotal moments along the way because you built your empire from scratch. Like, yeah. is is bare bones, bottom as possible. You started with one gym, losing $200,000 a year, and you turned that into 6,000 locations, 26 countries, including, you know, Snap Fitness, Yoga Fit, Nine Round, and a lot more. And so I just, I can't wait to dive into this, but I want to start with, I want to begin with your beginning. And so- yeah. How did your journey start and just where did the initial drive come from to become an entrepreneur? Well, great question. And there's a lot packed in there. I just start by saying, um, you know, the reason I love doing shows like this is I feel like I owe it to society and to every entrepreneur who's sitting at home, to every kid, not just kid, any adult, any person who is sitting home afraid to, afraid to take that jump right? To right. becoming that, that, that road to financial freedom or being your own boss. Cause it doesn't always work out. And it happened to have worked out for me. I'm that kid that grew up in a two room schoolhouse, youngest of seven kids. So wow. I'm living proof that look, the American dream, it's live and well. So well, how did my journey start? Really? When I was eight years old, my father mm -hmm. had a grocery store in, in the little hometown that I grew up in, in the Midwest in Minnesota. And um, my father, he's a man's man. He's a bit of a cowboy. In fact, he's a rancher out in South Dakota right now. <laughs> and uh, and at, eight, at eight years old, he goes, son, it's going to be like this. And I love the straight talk. I got a little of that in me, to be honest with you. He says, hey, son, it's going to be like this. You're going to do one of three things. You're either going to be in school, you're going to be playing sports, or you're going to be working for me. Well, that was, that was straight talk, and I could get my head around that, right? So in other words, he's saying, you're not going to be screwing around. You're not going to be getting right. into trouble. Right. And I needed that. Believe me, I have an identical twin and we were both full of piss and vinegar. Right. So we were ready. To <laughs> anyway, so I'm selling popcorn one day in, in, in front of his grocery store. That was right. my first job. And I didn't know as I sit back and reflect today, I honestly didn't know that so many of my life lessons were going to be learned at the footsteps of my father. So, so many profound lessons. And one of the first lessons I learned when I was eight I remember like it was yesterday, my father walks past me. I'm sitting behind my popcorn stand like a little eight-year-old boy does, right? Just waiting for someone to come up and ask for some popcorn. Yep. My dad walks about 40 steps past me. He stops. He pivots. He's looking right at me now. And he starts walking back towards me. Now, I'm thinking as an eight-year-old, oh, shit, what did I do now, right? <laughs> he stops in front of me and he says, hey, Peter, how are sales? And I started to go into my little eight-year-old dissertation and how sales were kind of slow. And I, I, got, I spit out about five or six words and he stops me and he goes, son, it's going to continue to be slow until you get out from behind that counter and go ask people if they'd like popcorn. And, I, and so I'm listening to him and I nod my head, right? I, and, I, and, and he leaves. So I muster up the courage. And keep in mind, I'm a shy kid. But right. that was a difficult moment. I got out there and for a little shy kid to go up and pull on the sleeve of, a, of an adult and they look down at you and you say, would you like some popcorn? I just popped it and you're giving them the hard sell, right? From, from the lens of an eight-year-old. Yep. And, and some people were kind, some were rude, but you got to understand people. So well, what the punchline for that lesson is, hey, look, if you want something to happen, you're either going to watch things happen or you're going to make things happen. So at eight years old, I'm blessed that my father dragged me by the hair and made me maybe learn that lesson on my own. So that, that's really how I got started in, in dealing with people. The other part that I learned with my father is my father, he owned the grocery store, but mm -hmm. it was not uncommon to see him at the checkout stand, carrying out groceries, um, stocking the shelves or shoveling the sidewalk. And what I, what I noticed about that is my father had unbelievable loyalty from his from his employees and I think he got that loyalty number one because he was a compassionate man yep. and number two they knew that he was gonna he was not afraid to get into the weeds with them he was not afraid to get in there man up and help get the job done and when you're willing to do that for all those people to your right and left you get you get unbelievable loyalty so I learned a lot of lessons through him in, in doing that and watching him Hmm. That's, you know, there's two points that I want to hit on that are really powerful. Number one, you know, it seems like there's a pattern with really successful people getting started really early in some form of sales when they were a kid. I can't tell you how many, whether it's popcorn or 
golf balls. I mean, just anything, some form of sales. Like I was selling candy bars. My mom would go to Sam's Club, buy chocolate bars. It was like 36 for $18 and we'd sell them for a dollar each. And it was just like, oh, 50% profit. This is perfect. Right, you're but, killing it. Yeah. And then the second thing is just never being too big to do the small things because I think that's that lesson right there is going to come in really handy when we talk about scaling here in just a little bit. Yes. You have to rely on people. So that's really powerful. And I was going to ask you, you know, what type of kid you were, and you mentioned already shy. Uh, could you just go into a little more detail? Like, were you outgoing, but shy? Did you kind of come out of your shell after selling popcorn? Like where did this little transition happen for, of, of confidence? It happened when I was about 13 and I, mm. You know, I played sports, but the the school the the school sports I was I was an average athlete, but for some reason when I I picked up a racquetball racket for the first time when I was thirteen, and and racquetball was just starting to take off as a sport. Yep, and that was a sport that suited my athletic style really really well. I can't explain why, but it did. So in a, in a period of of four years, I went from picking up a racket for the first time to being a touring, a sponsored touring pro. And my identical twin was the same way. I was sponsored by, by at the time, the large, the world's largest racket manufacturer. And I was traveling around the country playing racquetball tournaments and, and winning. So with that level of confidence of winning, and, and I knew that I, that I, that I knew that that was a sport that I was right. playing at a very high level. That's where the mm -hmm. confidence came from. And that's actually what introduced me to health and fitness space because traveling around the country playing racquetball, I got to see so many different styles of gyms and fitness yep. centers at the time that I knew, I knew the difference between how a gym was run well and not well. I mean, from just from the, from the face of being a pro coming in and, and how they engaged me and embraced me. So, and that's where my opportunity came about when back in the hometown that I played in, that club was losing money. It lost money from the day they opened it. And I remember when I was getting ready to move down to Orlando, Florida, I had breakfast with the owners of that club. And I said, look, I feel like I owe it to you guys. I'm just telling you that club is never going to make money for you as long as you have the person that you have running the gym. And I'll tell you why it's not a shot at him, but he's not, he's, he doesn't embrace the members. He's not engaged with the community. He barely does enough in the club. The club's failed. So I, I listed a number of things. And as I said, look, I feel I owe it to you because I was, I was honestly in that club about 25 to 30 hours a week. So I was there watching him. And then as I'm leaving that, that, that breakfast meeting that morning, I look over my shoulder and I kind of, I kind of just flippantly said, if you guys ever want to turn this club around, give me a call. Okay. <laughs> Year and a half later, my phone rings. So careful what you wish for. Yeah. And, and they said, Hey Peter, we'd like you to come and try to turn this club around for us. Uh, and they said, here's the deal. We'll pay you $16,000 a year. But if you can turn this thing around, you can buy us out with the profits. Now, the lesson there is that was my window. That was my opportunity. I had nothing going on. I was not going to make a living playing a racquetball. Right. Soup line. Right. So I was astute enough to say, look, this is my window. This is my opportunity. I don't know how bad it is, but I know it's an opportunity. Nevertheless, so I'm in. All right. So I packed my things, moved back to my hometown where I grew up and, and go down the path of turning that club around and was successful in doing it. And, and uh, over, over a period of 20 years, I not only turned that club around, but I built seven more before I ended up selling them. But one of the first lessons I learned when you talk about pivotal moments, yep. when, you're, when you're leading people, it was day two on the job. When I, when I pulled into town, unpacked my things, I go into the club and I'm going to do a, a, an inventory, a, an assessment of the business. And I'm walking around the club and one of the first things I noticed is this place is an absolute pigsty. Okay. <laughs> It needed a deep clean. So I called an all staff meeting. I said, look, we're going to have everybody show up tomorrow, eight o'clock. We're going to clean this club from corner to corner. We're going to give it a deep cleaning. So the next day rolls around. I'm, it's about eight o'clock in the morning. Everyone shows up and I'm getting ready to divide people into groups. And this woman steps forward and she says, hey, Peter, if you don't mind, I have something to say before we get started. And I said, Barb, by all means, what's on your mind? And she says, um, we don't clean, right? <laughs> Now, that's, and I appreciated that. I really do. And, and I said, that was a pivotal moment for me in terms of, I could have said, hey, Barb, you know what? 
Thank you for pointing that out. I appreciate your honesty and your candor. Anyone who doesn't want to clean, please go ahead. You, you can leave. Um, that was one option. Or the other option, which is the one I chose, I looked her in the eye. Now, keep in mind, I'm 22 years old. I am the youngest person there. I know maybe there's about 50 people there. I might know 10 or 15 of them by name, okay? I look her in the eye and I say, hey, Barb, and you also don't have a job. And I pointed to the door. Now, you could have heard a pin drop. That was, an, that was an oh shit moment for everyone in the room. And people are kind of looking at her and they're kind of looking at me. She ended up staying. But then I, I went from that to a, a 15 minute just talking about how do you want to show up? Right. I mean, we are, do, we are done. This is the last day of being average. So look, guys, we are going to, this is the last day where we are going to suck at what we do. I mean, I just gave it to them real. And I said, look, I will, I will lead this charge by example, but make no mistake about it. We are going to get engaged with our members. We are going to keep this club clean. We are going to turn this thing around. And then, and then I broke everyone up into groups and, and I took the toilets. I took the bathrooms. So that was, that's, that was that lesson that I learned back with my father. Hey, look, I'll take the dirty work. Right. Well, believe me, I ended up winning super <laughs> people over. And as the business started to turn, and it was through just like the things I said it was lacking, community involvement. I made a point to know the members by name. I got to know the members saying, hey, look, what does your wellness journey look like to you? Because everyone's journey is a little different. And right. these people are looking at me like, no one's ever asked me that before. Right? So I just got into the, I, I got into the weeds, into the character of the people, having these really intimate conversations. Because look, being overweight, it sucks. And right. it brings insecurity and all these things. So... You know, I was, I knew how much it hurt and I knew what a big deal it was for people to come in being 30, 40, 50 pounds overweight and trying to get a handle on it. So I, I always said, right. look, I'm going to try to get you to the promised land. That's awesome. I, I want to have you expand on the confidence because that right there, like the minute you said that I've already thought about 50 times in my own life where I had a decision to make, whether I'm talking to a client, my own staff, or somebody, it's just like you're, as an entrepreneur, you're just back and forth. It's like, do I man up and have that difficult conversation or say the thing that I'm scared to actually say, but I know needs to be said, or do I back down? And, and Tony Robbins said something, and, and this goes along the lines that I just want to have you share on confidence. Like, is it something that you believe is, is learn, like you learn in racquetball? Or do you believe that, like, because I know Tony Robbins always says, when he's like, you know, however you want to be just, or however you want to feel, just be that. And you'll start feeling that way. Like if you want to be happy, just start acting like you're happy and you'll start being happy. Like what's your take on, on confidence? Because I think that me personally, I think it's the number one thing that holds so many people back is just yeah. being confident. So there's a lot there to unpack. First of all, I'll say a fear. Fear is a dream killer. Yeah, right. Fear is a dream killer and fear, make no mistake about it. It resides between the six inches between your ears. Okay. So it's, it's something that you've conjured up in your head and generally speaking, it's fear of failure. Okay. It's fear of failure and the embarrassment that can come with that for some people, because all of us deep down, you'd like to think that you're proud and you have pride. So no one likes to fail, but I, I tell people all the time, every single person I know, and I'm not kidding you, every single one who's who's a self-made, I'm not talking about little trust fund babies because that's not who we roll. I'm talking about real self-made individuals. Mm -hmm. Every one of them will tell you one story after another how they overcame adversity. And I will tell you without, without a doubt, all of life lessons, whether it's in business or in your personal life, it comes through times of adversity. Yep. Right? So <laughs> that is the one thing. The other side of it is leadership. And in order to have leadership, Leadership, it's not a position in a company. Leadership is a mindset. And leadership starts with believing. And the first person you need to believe in is yourself. Do you know what I mean? Absolutely. You have, that. you have got to be able to look at yourself in the mirror. And if that's what it takes, I don't care if you've got to put a post-it note on your mirror that says, you have got this, right? I mean, and we've all done it. Yep. I'm, when, when I've gone on, I remember when I would go on do speeches um, at my, um, my international convention, mm -hmm. I would be in my hotel room and I would be looking at myself in the mirror, firing myself up because nobody wants tired Peter. They want Peter right. 
That's Peter, right. you know, blowing fire, you know what I mean? And so whatever you have to do to get in your mindset to say, look, I've got this, because there are times when that's how you have to lead. But I'll tell you what, you cannot lead without believing in yourself. Absolutely. Now, that brings me to a question that, because obviously you are king of culture. You can go in and you can see, probably detect in five seconds, whether the environment and the culture of the business is. If you had to guess, because I know a lot of businesses are getting killed right now with COVID, especially the smaller businesses. Like if you had to just guess a percentage, like what percentage of businesses do you think are, they could, I'm trying to see how to frame this question, right? Like you'll walk in and you think that they could succeed if they would just follow some of the principles that you you put into practice over at Snack? Because there's a lot of restaurants that are getting killed, but I wonder how many of those restaurants getting killed could change some things operationally, get to know their customers and do the things that you're talking about and still succeed despite what's going on right now because I feel like that's so important. That's a great question. And I would tell you, if I was to make a guess, I would say probably half. Mm. And here's the challenge. You can you can walk into some restaurants or health clubs, take it, any anyone that's in the service hospitality space. Yep. And when when you walk into those areas and 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 I, I keep thinking about them, the having it's I'll use the gym as an example. People have joined, it's not about heavier weights and faster treadmills. It's about the community and culture that you can generate between your four walls. And that comes through interaction. It's just like restaurants. There's a lot of restaurants out there that can serve decent food and good food. That's right. But there are, but there are some that actually knock it out of the park. Why? They knock it out of the park because they, their, their staff is so on point. Their staff is so engaged. And the culture, when you walk in, you can feel the energy. And that is what makes a difference. So there are many times that I go into businesses and, and I'll tell them, look, they may be making money. And I always tell them, and sometimes when they hire me as a consultant, they go, hey, Peter, look, we don't want you to talk about that. Look, make a mistake about it, Peter. We're making money. We're making money here. Right. And I tell them, you're making money, but this isn't about money. I'm talking about how much money you're leaving on the table. So I'm not saying that your business is losing money. I'm going to help you make more money. And I'm not, I'm not only going to help you make more money, but I'm going to help you create uh, more stickiness with your customers to where when things happen like COVID, they're going to find ways to do business with you. That's right. Right? I mean, there's a lot there to unpack. It's, uh, but some people, they just don't get it. And, and that's yeah. what the heavy lifting is. The heavy lifting is going out of your way to be kind to somebody and do that extra step to make them feel special and loved. And like Abs- Absolutely. When we do our staff meetings at the daycare, one of the things that I do is I, I always talk about what we call the Chick-fil-A experience. And I have our staff go to McDonald's and then go to Chick-fil-A. And then we talk about like, what's the difference, right? Like it's, they're both serving food, but it's just, it's so different. Even when COVID hit, right? Like Chick-fil-A, they come out of the store there. It was cold at, like here in Tennessee. I think it was like maybe March when it first hit, but they were outside taking orders getting engaged. I mean, it, like it was so right. powerful right. just to see them go that extra mile and create that experience. And that's why even being closed on a Sunday, they generate like way more revenue than a McDonald's. Like it's just, it's, no, it's, yeah, and you know what, and, and here's the, it's a, it's a mindset. Sometimes when people face adversity, you know, it, it's so interesting and it, and it happens in personal lives and in business. Some people, when they get adversity, they tell you reasons why they can't and others are going to tell you how they can big difference. And that is a mindset. So some people are problem solvers yep. and, and, I tell you, and, I, and, and here's another leadership tip that when you have people in your, within your team that are problem solvers, you've got to give them accolades and not just mm. pull, not pulling them into your office and saying, Hey, Hey Joe, great job. You have to do it in front of their peers. Okay, right. because that matters, because That's then right. others will aspire to do that. Because why? Because they want the, those accolades uh, amongst their peers, right? Absolutely. What do they say? They, people work for money, but will die for recognition. I think that's- It's a true statement. Yeah. And you know what the loyalty that you bring in when, I mean, with, with the staff that I had over the years, I had the privilege, and I always say winning in business, make no mistake about it, it's a team sport. Yep. 
you need people to go to battle for you, especially if you're going to scale and scale with any level of trajectory. You've got to have people that can stay in their lane, are going to be responsible, accountable, and will follow you off a cliff if need be. Absolutely. And I have, before we get into scaling, I have two quick questions um, on that. Number one is obviously you take over this little gym, it's losing a bunch of money. Could you just share a couple of things? Like, are there a couple like really creative and resourceful things that you had to do while you were bootstrapping? Because yeah. <laughs> 16000 a year really isn't a lot of money. And I'm sure they didn't give you much of a budget because you're losing money. Well, so I'm just interested to know like a couple of the creative things that you had to do while bootstrapping that really ended up paying off. Sure. It's easy. And believe me, a lot of those lessons that I learned, because I was, I was a street smart kid. And I always yep. say I'd rather be street smart than book smart any day. So literally, I'm a week on the job. And I remember talking to the, to the owners and saying, look, what's my advertising budget? <laughs> and they, these guys looked at me and they said, hey, Peter, maybe you will hear us. We lose 200 grand a year. Not like on paper. We each, the five owners, we each throw in 40000 a year just to pay the bills here. So Mm. This is this is where we're at. We have no budget. So for me, I got creative. I remember I said, look, this place, I, I've got it cleaned up. But still, at the end of the day, it was like putting lipstick on a pig. I needed, <laughs> I needed to, I needed to, I needed paint. I needed carpet, right? Forget about new equipment. I just need to do the basic block and tackling. And I remember I walked into a carpet store mm. and I walked in there with my chin up and my chest out. And I said, look, I need some carpet but I have a problem. I don't have any money. I said, I don't have any money, but I have memberships. So I would like to trade you. I'll give memberships for you and all of your staff and their families. If you'll give me some carpet. Okay. <laughs> That's and the awesome. Surprised, they said, yeah. And I went to a number, I went to every carpet store. I went, I, I bartered with painters, electricians. I went to the florist for plants. I was bartering everything I could because I had no cash flow. Right. And, and when I started remodeling the club, it was, the club was about 40,000 square feet. I started, oh, at wow. the, I started at the front door because I said, look, I've only got, you only get one chance for a first impression. So I'm going to start at the front door. So people are going to see, oh, they remodeled the entry, right? So I did that and I, and I worked my way front door all the way out the back door and in the process. So now I was, the club was getting a facelift. When people walk in, this guy with the mullet is calling him by name, right? Um, the, the rest of the, of the uh, employees are on their game, and the club is clean, and, and they're, we're asking the right questions. And then I got involved in the community. If there was a parade, I was there. I was going to businesses and, and saying, look, would you like a free pass to come and try my club? Because I knew if they didn't walk in my doors, I didn't have an opportunity to sell. There was no online enrollment at that That's time. That's right. Okay. There was no online enrollment. There was, there was no internet. Okay. So, I mean, think about that. So, at, at, any, at any rate, it was... Uh, you know, that's what turned the business around that loyalty. It, so it was getting creative and innovative. And honestly, in four years, I took a business from losing 200,000 to making 250,000 a year. You talk about a swing, my gosh. I mean, and that, and I, I, at that point I was off to the races. That's awesome. And that's a really valid point for the audience too, is because so many people think like turnarounds happen overnight, but you're talking, I mean, it's four years. It takes commitment, consistency, focus, discipline, dedication. And like, did you think it was going to happen faster or were you pretty aware that it's just one step at a time? It was, that's a, a great question. And that's something for people. You know what, when, when I'm talking to, to entrepreneurs today, I tell them patience, but right. I also tell them, look, for me, when I was doing things and I could start to see things starting to turn, when I could see the deposits slowly increasing, when I could see the visit counts were starting to increase a little bit more, when I could see the member engagement was, was, was getting to a new heightened level, I knew that I was moving the ball down the field, right? right. So, and that was the key. Once I felt like I had some momentum, I never looked back. I tell you what, that momentum motivated me because why? I had no plan B. There was right. no plan B, okay? If this failed, I would back home living with my parents. I mean, honestly. So there was no plan B. And sometimes you need to run a business with that level of paranoia and fear. If that's what it takes to get up early and stay late, by God, do it. Burn the ships. That's absolutely. 
So my next question, and this is, I, I didn't catch this in any of the interviews that I listened to, but this is something that's always fascinated me as to how important of a role this plays into business. Like, where did you figure out operation side of things? Like everything from branding to accounting to, you know, just running the number, like all of the things that also go in that, you know, a lot of times you can outsource if you get the big things in place. But did you have to like learn all of that from the ground up, like managing a budget, creating logos, like how did all of that play into creating Snap Fitness? Well, on the starting, when it, well, let's start with accounting. <laughs> when I stepped into the business, it was literally, forget about depreciation and creating creative accounting principles. It was purely, I looked at everything from a cash flow basis. Right. How much cash is coming in? What bills am I holding? I mean, and it was a magic balancing act of that. So forget <laughs> about Forget about accounting principles. It was yeah. pure cash flow. Now, eventually, when I got to a place, I hired a, an accountant to do the books because I, I, had to, I had to keep the business legal, right? Yep. So that was the accounting side. But the other side of operations and people, a lot of it is common sense. And I keep tell people this all the time. Look, succeeding in business in many cases, especially if it's people-facing, if you're delivering a service or, or even delivering a product, you know, a right. physical product, you have to deliver it on time, right? And there's a number of different ways that you can deliver it. You could, you know, some people deliver with a smile. Some people just throw the package at the door, right? So right. How, how do you want to roll? How do you want to show up? And for me, it was all about showing up with compassion, having passion for whatever it is I'm doing, and compassion for everyone that I'm around. And people would see me, you know, people would see that the quiet moments, you know, to me, the character is defined by someone. What do you do when no one's watching? Absolutely. And that, and that is it. So my, my team would see me, even as I was gaining success along the way, if I'm walking down the street and I see homeless person, I sit up with people. I even do it today. I sit down with people. Hey, how are you? I make friends. Now I give them, I give them some money, but it's not about the money. It's about giving the confidence and taking the time. And I learned early on in life that, man, Time is the most, time is the one thing that levels the playing field. You can't, you can't buy any more. You don't get any less. We all get 24, right? So use them wisely. And once, and once that second is gone, it doesn't come back. So you don't get a do over. So there's just so much. So, so to, to, you know, the, 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 the long answer to your short question is just really a lot of common sense because it's not like I was an attorney or a yeah, doctor where I need right. to learn a trade. This is, this is understanding people and caring about people. And if you can grasp that, then you just have to put yourself in the shoes of your customer, who's ever on the receiving end. And you got to say, what can I do to make whatever that experience looks like more special? Man, that's, that's such that's a great soundbite right there. Such great advice. I, I was listening to a podcast. Uh, are you familiar with Tim Ferriss, the four hour work week guy? And yeah. he, there was an interview being done on him and it was just fascinating. And he said almost exactly what you're saying. He's like, you know, sometimes I'll take three weeks and I won't do anything. He's like, I'll just think. And the guy's like, why would you do that? Isn't that wasting time? And he's like, no. He's like, you know, in any given day, I have a thousand dominoes that I need to tip over and juggle. It's just a million things. But he's like, I always try to take the time to think about, well, what are the big dominoes that if I can just knock down the big domino, it'll knock all the other little dominoes. And yeah. you just said it, you know, it's like, if you just focus on people, that's the big domino and yeah. all of the other little dominoes, they'll just handle themselves. That's really, really powerful. So four years, you take this gym from losing money to making a quarter million a year. So what happens to that? Do you buy the four, four guys out? Do you open up your second location first? Like, how does this play out? Well, the first thing I had to do was get, I needed to, to get the partners out. So even yep. though four years I get this business humming and making money, it still took me another five years, four, another four years to buy them out. Okay. Wow. So I had to buy them out. So now I'm in this thing. I'm nine years into it. Okay. I still have the one club, but I own it free and clear. It's my baby. Okay. Now, it, so then at that point, once I had everyone out of the business, I went right back to the bank and I got a loan to build another club. <laughs> right, and I did 
seven times. And the banker says, you know, the banker was a member of my club. Mm. God bless him. Because without him, I, I wouldn't be where, where I am today because he took a chance on me, which I appreciate. And I still bank with that bank today. So no, I, that's, I, yeah, I'm really loyal. Okay. Because I don't forget where I came from. That's right. And, um, and at, at any rate, um, so, and I did that seven times. As soon as I would build a club, now I had two clubs paying off one, one loan. As soon as that loan got halfway down, I went and got another loan. I built another club, built the line, built the loan back up. Now I have three clubs. I did it seven times. Okay. And eventually, wow. and I did it seven times. I did it for 20 years. All right. Then I, I sold those clubs because at the time I was married, I had three small kids and I was, I was traveling a lot to these clubs, seven clubs. I was always, and, and I just felt like I wanted to be home more. And I had right. been doing this for 20 years. Well, I sold it. And then, and then literally one of my employees that had been with me for 10 years, mm -hmm. quit college to come and work for me. Um, he said, I don't like who you sold the company to when you, when you're, when you're, part of a company for 20 years. That's right. You, the culture is, it, it's you. Okay. And when, when you leave the cornerstone, the culture of that business, a lot of times leaves with the founder. Mm -hmm. So he couldn't make the adjustment to the new ownership. Um, and so out of kindness for me, I said, look, I'll, I'll build you a small club. I didn't know at the time it was going to be snap fitness. Okay. I was just, doing him a favor. And I said, man, I don't want to go build one of these big full service clubs that cost so much money. It's so expensive. So I took out the swimming pools. I took out the racquetball courts, the aerobic studios. Before I knew it, this thing was like 4,000 square feet and had two employees instead of 50. Right. <laughs> um, and I built it and the club, I sold enough memberships in 90 days to cash flow it for the year. Okay. In 90 days. I was so surprised by it and curious about it, I said to him, would you like another one, right? I built another one in a, in a market that was half the size of the, the first one. And same performance, 90 days, <laughs> okay? Well, then this guy, he lived in a small town of like 3,500 people. I said, I'm going to build one in this town because I need to know how small, small can be. Because the, and, and it performed the same way. The unit level economics fell into place. And I always tell people, look, in business, and I don't care what kind of business it is, it's not what you take in the front door, it's what you take out the back door. That's right. So I don't care if you're doing 15,000 a month of total revenue, but if your fixed costs are 6,000 and you're banking, you know, nine grand a month on a $100,000 cash investment, I mean, I do it any day that ends in Y, right? So. For me, I knew I had a tiger by the tail when I, when I, at that point, I knew I had a tiger by the tail and I immediately focused on franchising. I had some of the best franchise attorneys in the country. I didn't cut corners, all right? Mm -hmm. I wasn't going to piecemeal this thing. I wasn't going to MacGyver it. I literally said, look, I'm going to, I'm going to do this right and buy the book. And, you know, to my credit, I did. I spent the money where I needed to. And, and even at that time, if somebody had said, hey, Peter, do you think you're going to build one of the largest wellness brands in the world? I would have said, honestly, I would have said, probably not, <laughs> but I know I'm, but I know I'm capable of it. Right. right. That would have been my answer. Probably not because who says that? Right. <laughs> right. But yeah. I tell you what, as I sit back today, I, I mean, I knew that I could, I knew, and some of my friends will say, some of my real, my inner circle friends, they'll say, you'll never outwork Peter. I'm a maniac, right? Be, because I know what it takes and I know what road rash feels like. Right. I know what overcoming adversity feels like. I, I know how to win um, and I know where the challenges lie. So um, that's why I love consulting today. I absolutely love it because I can see the potholes like it's right in front of me. And I tell mm. them, turn here, turn there, jump. You know, it's just, I love it. Was it surreal when you started? Because I mean, to go that to that many locations, you had to get to a point where you're opening like one, one a day, one a week. I That's... got you. my fourth year of Snap Fitness. My fourth year, I opened 377 stores in one year. I'm not <laughs> talking about signing up 307 franchises. I'm talking about <laughs> clubs opening their front doors, ready for ready for members. We were opening a club more than one a day. But you know, the beautiful part. If you walked into my office, my world headquarters, mm -hmm. 
would not see people running around with their hair on fire. And that's one of the things that I'm really disciplined on. I'm really disciplined on systems and processes, and I'm really good at having people stay in their lane. Early on in a company's beginning, I just did a consult yesterday with a company. It's a baby company, and they want to expand. I said, look, the first five or six employees you have, they got to be like Navy SEALs. They got to be able to multitask and do each other's job because you don't have the cash flow to assign a person for every job. It doesn't, you don't have the money, okay? Mm. And these guys, they're bootstrapping it, which I love. I love these people that, that have got grit. They, they're not gonna be under their desk in the fetal position when things get tough. They're gonna be problem right. solvers, right? So just setting them down that path. But I was really good at getting people to stay in their lane and getting people to really understand my culture and my passion. So I hired personalities. I hired people that had the, that were, had the same makeup, that they were coachable and they were willing to give it 100%. Man, that's incredible. Now, can you share a little, like, did you have any major missteps along the way or make any bad pivots or any big mistakes while you were growing and scaling this fast? Yeah, you know, one of the, one of the first international countries I went to was India. Hmm. And India, as much as it's a great culture, it's it's one of the toughest countries in the world to do commerce, personally. Really? It's really tough to do business in India. Really tough. Hmm. Um, so, you know, I, I wish if I had that to do over again, yeah, I would have saved myself a lot of agony because literally, I think I was focusing probably 70% of my efforts to, to generate uh, 3 or 5% of my EBITDA, right? And I, it finally threw my hands in the air. But you know what? Had I not learned that lesson early on, yep. I, I did not repeat that lesson. So I would say make mistakes. It's okay. Learn fast, learn early, and don't repeat them. So I, you know, and it's not that I've got to try to find a silver lining in every mistake I made, but at the end of the day, they're mistakes. I analyze them. I take I, I, and I pull back. I make sure that my team members understand. And if it's a mistake that I made, I own it. And that's an, that's another ship about leadership. Not to get off track, but leadership, yeah, no leadership. You can't you can't only take the wins. Okay, you can't just take the wins. That's not that's not how it rolls. If you're going to take the wins, you got to own the losses. Yep. Okay. It's it's not when you lose. And you're, if you're the one flying the plane, if you're the CEO, if you're the guy, and you're, th those decisions, even if it's someone else, but they report up to you, it's yours. You got to own right. it. And right. so, you know what? I, I, I own my decisions, and, and we learn fast. And, and, I, and I say, hey, look, everybody, shoulders square, chins up. Let's go. You know? <laughs> Absolutely. Now, you continue to scale. Did you get into like an acquisition phase as well? Start go venturing off? Because I know the brand owns, Lyft Brands is the brand now, and they own like all kinds of different. Yeah. So here's, you know, I'll, I'll give you a perfect example. The, the Fitness on Demand. Fitness on Demand is a, is a brand that I created mm -hmm. uh, with the help of another individual who I thought was an expert. And I tell you how it started. I went to a company who had a product. I liked their product, but when you're growing at a fast pace like I was, yep. that company that I approached, they had a they signed a clause. One of my competitors made them sign a clause that they would never sell to Peter Townton or any of his brands. Okay? <laughs> so I said, hey, look, this is silly. And I tried to solve the problem. I said, How about if I just buy you? I'm gonna buy you, but you can go ahead and sell to them because that's nonsense, right? Right. But they, couldn't. they wouldn't sell. The guy was too passionate. So I had to go create my own brand. And that's literally 3,000 locations today. I, ha I had to. It would have been a hell of a lot easier to buy them. But you know what? I knew that it was a product and a service that we wanted to have. So in 2008 and nine, remember when the real estate crashed? Yes, sir. When that real estate crashed, you know, there's been three pivotal moments here in the last, in the last 15, 20 years. In, in all three, the dot-com crash. Okay? Yep. That, was, that was a huge reset for our economy. 2008 or nine, real estate crash. Okay, And now COVID. Okay? Right. COVID's the worst of the three by, by far. But in 08, 09, when that crash took place, I was sitting on cash. I had no debt. And I was sitting on a lot of cash. And when everyone else was ducking in their potholes, in their, in their, in their potholes I was standing up. Right. And I, because I had cash and people were scared. So I got into payment financing, you know, payment mm -hmm. processing. I made some acquisitions 
because I was flush with cash yep. and I, was, I knew that I was building a universe around me that if, that if I bought, if I got into payment processing, that even if I only just did payment processing for the brands I owned, I would, it would be, it would be a, a great business within a business. That's right. So that's why you have Lyft brands and underneath Lyft brands, you've got a series of other brands that are not only consumer brands, but, but products as well. Man, that's, that's awesome. I have one last question before I pivot just a little bit. Are we, are we still okay on time? Yeah, you're fine. You got me another 30, 40 minutes. Perfect. So I want to hone in just on your advice from getting to the second location from the first, whether regardless of what they're doing, what are some things that need to happen before somebody should even consider opening up number two. I feel like people get so antsy and like, I want to expand, I want to expand, but they have not built a foundation. Like, is there any just advice that you would give someone that has one location or they're a solopreneur? Like what things need to be in place processes, systems wise, mindset wise, before they even think about scale? Great question. I'm doing some consulting now for a company that I actually took a position in. Um, Mm but it is a, a, a small company. They have two locations and they want to franchise. So the, the first thing that I'm, that I'm doing for them is we're, we're pulling back and looking at, cause if there's no scale in building every, every unit as a one-off, yep. there's no scale in that. So today, what are we doing? We're going in, we're taking a, a, a real physical inventory. I walked through their location, their store and started eliminating things because for instance, like shelving, like racking. Okay. Mm -hmm. This happens to be a restaurant concept, the racking, they've got all different size of rackings. And I said, look guys, we got to streamline this. This has got to be restauranting for dummies. Okay. So I told them you're going to go from four shelf sizes to two. Okay. And we're going to have, we're going to create what we call a go fast kit, meaning that. And I always say, if we're going to expand, don't, go into it with the mindset that you're going to do 10 locations. I look at it. I say, look, what is my goal? My goal is to take you to a thousand locations. That's my goal. I I just say a thousand because it's an easy number to get my head around. But keep in mind, if you've got a thousand units in a franchise system, you are one tenth of 1% of the popular of the franchise system. So that you are in a very, very elite fraternity. So that's when you've done a thousand of anything, you're world class, 100%. You know what I mean? You're world Absolutely. class. Absolutely. So for, for me, it's really stepping back and, and, and really trying to create systems around everything from cabinetry to, you know, whatever the, 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 the front of the house and the back of the house, whatever that looks like. Just really compartmentalizing it. The, the omniance within this restaurant. What is, you know, what are, what are the walls look like? What's the decor look like? Because everything that you put in the hands of a franchisee, the more decisions that they have to make, the slower the process becomes. So you have to dummy it down. You have to say, look, here's your decor package. Here's your, 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 your back of the house package, which is tables, prep tables, everything, freezers, all of it. That's all there. Here's your front of the house package. So you just dummy it down. Here's your marketing package as soon as your lease is signed. So for me, I had franchise sales division. I had a real estate division. Mm-hmm. I had a pro- project management slash construction division. I had marketing division doing pre-sales before the store even opened. And then, and then franchisee support and ongoing marketing. That's oh, the I love that. So like the, <laughs> I believe people are going to have to listen to this over and over and over. Cause there's just so many like really good nuggets of wisdom, like every five seconds. So I, I want to pivot a little bit to get to the other side of things just to, to finish this out because this is something that, you know, everybody that's building something, they build it for a reason, a feeling, a milestone, a goal. And you've been on the other side of this for, for some time now, and you're still living your life. You're still building things. You're still an operator. You're getting in the trenches and that's so, it's so powerful and it's so inspiring to see, but can you share just like, what is, what is life like on the other side of success? Because I think people wonder like the day that you know you have set yourself and your family financially free, like now what? Like what goes through your mind? What do you focus on? What do you think about? Is it contribution? Is it what's next? Is, is it all just a game now? Like I'm really excited to get your take on this. 
it's well first of all for every entrepreneur the the moment that you know your life has changed and it's never going to be the same and and you're going to have i i hope that every entrepreneur has that chance that a chance to experience that for me it's when i built my company snap fitness Mm -hmm. And at the time I had six or 700 locations and it, the right thing to do. And I do this. I talk about this a lot. And when I'm consulting, you need to take some chips off the table. It's the fiduciary responsibility of the, 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 that you owe to yourself and your family and everyone who's ever worked in the trenches with you, right? To take some chips off the table. So in my case, I sold 40% of my company and I sold it for about 40, 47 million. Okay. Wow. The, the, the moment for me that changed, I remember I was walking down the fairway, the first fairway at Spring Hill Golf Course. My phone rings. It's my attorneys. And they say, Peter, um, the, the, the funds have landed in your account. <laughs> and I literally went to my mobile app and there was $47 million in change in my checking account. Literally, I, look up, I looked up in the sky. It was so emotional. I, literally, I was tears streaming down my face. And oh. my, my friends are like, Peter, what the fuck is going on? <laughs> And I just said, you know what I did? I, I literally, I said, I did it. Mm. I fucking did it. The kid from the two room schoolhouse, I did it, right? So I knew my life, I knew I was never going to, to, to have to worry about finances. I knew that my family was gonna be taking care of my kids, kids, kids couldn't spend the money. Right. And, and then five years later, I sold another chunk for about the same amount, right? So. So today, as I look at it, it's it's not about the money. One right. of the things that I'm that I'm that I'm I'm proud of, and it's a lesson that I learned from my father. And and my dad, he's a wealthy guy, but he 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 doesn't he doesn't have crazy money. Okay, but right. he's but in his own right, he's done really, really well. He's a self-made guy. Um, but I I didn't lose myself in the process. And and I just talked about this yesterday. When you create, you know, this unbelievable wealth it's really easy to lose yourself in that process. And I'm thankful that I didn't. I didn't because I always reflect on, I'm still that kid that grew up in a two-room schoolhouse. I'm still that guy. I'm still the youngest of seven kids with an identical twin brother. Um, I mean, right now, I'm wearing jeans with, with a rip in the knees. I've got a, you know, a, a T-shirt on. For yep. me, it, that's not, it's how do you want to show up now? It's surreal. I'm not going to lie to you. I mean, my private jet, my yacht, my, my, I'm in a $10 million lake house here that I spend three months of the year in penthouse in Miami, Ferrari, Aston Martin. Where does it stop? I mean, right. I'm, and literally I just said to, to myself, literally just a couple of years ago, I said, Peter, are you freaking done yet? Are you done just buying shit like a, like a spoiled little brat? Just stop it already. So I did. I, I kind of said, look, I, I was a little bit ashamed about it, to be perfectly honest with you, mm -hmm. and, and really focused my efforts on, um, you know, reconnecting with people, with my friends that I, had, that, I had, that I had left through the course of trying to build a company. So reconnecting with people, being more intentional with what I do with my time, the consulting that I do. If it's corporate America, I charge them. And I donate 100% of it to my charity. Um, mm. if, it's, if it's young entrepreneurs, I don't charge them, right? Because I feel I, I owe it. This, this kid, I owe it. I mean, I think everyone who wins, you owe it to go back into the trenches and give people a leg up to, to help them find their way to, the, to financial freedom and the American dream. I did it and I couldn't have done it without observing a lot of people around me. Right. And so I'm, I'm forever blessed and thankful. And, and I hope, you know, my legacy, when I, when, when I think about it, I hope that someday when I die, that people aren't saying, you know, man, you, you know, he's a, a wealthy guy because wealth doesn't define me. I hope they say, right. you know what? He kept it together. He was humble. He was kind. He was compassionate. Uh, and, and you could trust him. He had character. <laughs> I think anybody that listens to this interview or any of the interviews that you've done for that matter will be able to tell in two seconds that that's who you are. I mean, it's just, you can, you can sense that you can feel, it's just like, like Dwayne Johnson, the rock. Like if you ever watch him on Instagram, it's the same way. It's like, you know, he's worth four or $500 million, but it is just like, you know, he always talks about the hardest being the hardest worker in the room 
and the work ethic and every Instagram is to help somebody else. It's never to brag. It's never like, it's just, there's certain people like that that you can tell. And that's, man, that's, that's really awesome. Uh, I just have a couple more questions. Oh, well, one is what is your charity, by the way? Like what charity do you believe in? Well, it's, I'll tell you what, it, it's the Peter Townsend Warrior Foundation. And my hmm. tagline is fighting the good fight. So what is fighting the good fight? For me, I love, I love um, helping supply um, service dogs for soldiers that suffer from PTSD. Mm. Um, I love um, helping pay for the education of families of fallen soldiers. I love that. Um, I love trying to put a stop to um, uh, poaching, right? I, I, have, I have a lodge in the Serengeti, a, a five-star lodge in the Serengeti. Poaching is very prevalent uh, in, in that area. So literally, I just have compassion for it. how can somebody – a 50-year-old elephant with beautiful tusks who's just minding their own business. Right. They, go, they, they go drink in one of the watering holes and somebody plants one behind his ear from 500 yards. Just really, that kind of, that kind of shit drives me crazy. Absolutely. And then, and then roll up and saw the tusks up and let the carcass rot. It's just so inhumane. Today, in an age, it's so, it's so profoundly wrong, right? And I think that's, you know, some people, and it's not... It, it's not the native, um, you know, Maasai who, it's not the person that actually shot him. You got to go, you know, five levels up to the, to the pussy that's sitting back there paying for him to go do that. Cause he's just trying to feed his family. Right. That's right. So what, what I try to do with my village, 95, 90% of my staff at my lodge, I hire from the village. So hmm. I empower them. Some of them don't speak English. We te we teach an English class once a week within my lodge because speaking English in only in my humble opinion, speaking English in the Serengeti around where my lodge is, that's your ticket to freedom. Okay. Because you've got to be able to, you got to empower people to speak English so they can speak right. to tourists. Okay. No one speaks Swahili. Okay. So it's, I mean, that's, say figuratively, right? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Man, that's that's awesome. I uh, I'll have to send this to you after we're done. Uh, I interviewed an old buddy of mine. He's probably been in more combat than any any other, like, probably top five in the world for how much time he's spent in war. And it was really amazing because he's over at our house one night and he showed us this video. And he was in Afghanistan, and there was this. They had cleared the area and he went in and he was, you know, he's infantry, he's a seer. And so uh, he, 60 Minutes just happened to have sent a reporter in to film this. Like after the area was clear, it was safe. And, and he's walking with the photographer or, and the videographer and they didn't clear this cave all the way. And it's all on film. Like this guy in Afghanistan comes out with a gun my friend sees him and they shoot at each other. And, you know, my friend, obviously the other guy died, but my friend got shot, but he survived and 60 minutes filmed the entire thing. And it was just, but the whole interview was on that, right? Like how has he fought in that much war and how has he kept his mind really strong? Cause he has a really positive outlook despite having all of his friends died and him for him, it was jujitsu. He's like, he just found an outlet. And so yeah. it's just really powerful that, that you do that. Um, man, that's, that's can you, awesome. Can you imagine how surreal that would be to, ha to literally be literally fighting for your life? Okay. Every day. I mean, can you imagine, I can't imagine it. I mean, I can't imagine how you come out of that with any level of sanity. I, 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 yeah, seriously. I mean, I was, I was Navy because I was an engineer, so I saw no combat. I just fixed yeah. pumps and generators. Yeah. But I just I, like it, just hearing his stories. Like I, like, I mean, he, he'll, he's lost hundreds of his closest friends and it's just, it's wild, man. Some people are just more mentally tough, I guess, and they find better ways, outlets, giving back, you know, how to f channel that trauma into something productive. But yeah, I, uh, you know, for me, it's like, I can mentally imagine handling anything for me. It's just like, I can't picture how like losing a child. Yeah. No, right. I cannot. In my preschool, um, oh, made me tear up a little bit, but it's uh, we have a girl that she went to my preschool before I purchased it, um, but she has uh, stage four leukemia right now, and so like we're donating and we're doing everything we can for her, and I'm just I'm just watching the parents, and I'm like, man, how are you? 
like it's like I want to interview them. It's like how are you getting through this? Because I I can't even imagine what I would do. Like it would no, just right. It's, yeah. it's every every parent. The, the, your worst nightmare is burying one of your children. Mm. I mean, it's it's uh, it's and you, and you see it happen or or a tragic accident where they're taken from you so you know so quickly with in no chance for goodbyes. I can't imagine. Right. It's uh, yeah. That, that's every parent's nightmare. I would imagine. I know yeah, and I, I don't know how they did it like in the 17, 1800s where it was like common. Like it's just, man, it's a whole le- different level of mental toughness back then. Today it's like, how can I be a victim? Oh, you stepped on my toe. I'm so mad at you. Yeah, it's crazy. Everyone so to, so fast to play that victim card. It's so yeah. Fast. It's, <laughs> that's a whole other topic. Right? That is a whole other interview, maybe not recorded. Yeah. Um, so my, my final question is, just it's a basic one you know investing wise because making money and keeping money are two different things and you know obviously you've been able to mingle and network with really smart people over the years you know you don't get to where you are without building a great circle around you you know what are some of the things that that you invest in like what are some of your passion projects some of the things that you're doing now yeah so the First of all, to say if you're able to create financial success, okay. So take take myself, so a hundred million net worth guy. I have a lot of diversity. Mm-hmm. So when the world feels like it's coming to an end, am I am I am I taking shots on the, on the chin? I am, but the, the the ship is never in danger of sinking. Okay. Right. So I have diversity. So what do I do? I own I own a fair amount of real estate apartments, condos, things like that, that are, that are generating a steady income for me with, with tenants. So, so that's one. So I have cash flow coming in. All right? yep. That's one thing I, I launched. I have my lodge in the Serengeti. Um, I own a manufacturing company that, that uh, creates biodegradable pellets that get put in injection moldings to change the world. So the things that I'm really passionate about today are things that are going to change the world. If, if you could biodegradable things. So but like the little K cups, like you make, when you make coffee, you know, you put in that little machine. Yeah. 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 Those things just fill up landfills. Okay. They're not biodegradable. Mm-hmm. All right. So creating a biodegradable cup, um, same with plastic, anything plastic today that sits in our landfills that are oil based. I I'm inventing things right now that are, that are biodegradable. The interior signage of stores. I mean, I could, that's a whole other topic, but I'm just, Things that change. So I, I, I do that. I'm in a manufacturer. I have my lodge in Africa. I own a lot of real estate. Um, I just launched a CBD company called Elevare Labs. So that's yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's great for CBD. If you're not taking that, you should. It's great. And my product is great. I appreciate anything anyone can do there. Oh, hey, I'm going to put all the links for everything. That's my final thing. So don't worry about that. It's CBD fun. is, it's, yeah. and a lot, everybody loves it. And then the last one is the music business. I know you're from Nashville. And yes, sir. I, I have a three-day music festival that I host here in Minnesota. This year, unfortunately, we had to cancel because of COVID. But, but the, the artists, I, all the artists, God bless them, are, are coming back n- next year. They signed for next year. So uh, Carrie Underwood, Nashville gal. Uh, yeah. Zach Brown, um, uh, Leonard Skinner. So I've got some great talent coming in. Uh, last, la- last time I had it was Tim McGraw. He's a Nashville guy. Uh, and then we spoke earlier, Pitbull. I've heard of him. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> so, you know, I've, I've had the privilege of meeting some really, really cool stand-up people. So the music business, why do I love it? Number one, it's a cool vibe, but I've met some great people and, and I'm putting smiles on people's faces, which, which brings me joy. Oh, I love that. Final question, Peter. You, you're able to go back in time 30 years ago. You get to spend only 60 seconds with yourself. And that's it before you disappear. What would you say? I would say, hey, Peter, dance more. And I say that figuratively. And I, I, I've said this before in other interviews. If I had it to do over again, I, and I know that I probably couldn't have. I wish that I had taken the time to enjoy the ride a little bit more. But I ran my business with such paranoia, such fear of losing it because I had yep. no plan B. So I wish if I had it to do over again, I would say dance more. You know, mm-hmm. enjoy life a little bit more. Now, having said, said that, um, I don't know that I could be where I am today without that level of fire. That's so right. you don't get to do over. So I, I have no regrets from it because you can't change history. You can just change how I roll moving forward, which is why today I'm so committed to 
number one, doing things that fill my heart, being compassionate and loving to others, um, trying to make a difference in every place that I go. I, and, and, and then, you know, obviously we talked about this a little bit earlier, you know, I'm, 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 I'm looking for love again, right? I'm looking for the girl of my dreams. And people say, Peter, you're freaking crazy. Honestly, it's just meeting, meeting, you know, and I have this vision of her, this Latin woman with olive skin and dark hair and I've, I've got this vision and I'm not rushing it, but I want someone that I can make memories with and travel right. the world with that. And it's, it's easier said than done. When you have a lot, there's no shortage of people coming at you. And sometimes you feel like you've got raw meat around your neck, right? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, uh, Matthew McConaughey figured it out. He, uh, his wife is almost exactly how you just described right there. And yeah, no, exactly. And I'm in, a, I'm in Miami, right. But just, <laughs> just finding that, that, you know, I'm just drawn to that dark hair and olive skin. Yep. Um, and, but with a beautiful heart, right. Because she's beautiful and she's in shape and, but she hasn't lost her soul in the process. That's right. You know what I mean? That's absolutely that's where it gets sticky. Meeting beautiful women. That's easy. But meeting one who says, look, man, I, I love your heart before I love your wallet. Absolutely. So, Peter, how can people connect with you? What's the best way to follow your content, your brand, the things that you're doing? Like, I, I have no doubt, and I mean this, that everyone is going to want to follow you yeah, after they listen to this. What, like, what's the best? I mean, your charity is one. I'll put that in the link. Your CBD line as well. But just how can people find out what, uh, about all of those things? The, the best way to follow me is really right on Instagram. And I keep it really simple. It's, it's Peter, P-E-T-E-R underscore. And then my last name, Taunton, T-A-U-N-T-O-N. And I post... I post little nuggets of life experiences, some as motivational and some as just practicality of how to win. And then, you know, my stories, those are my, that's my wall posts, but yep. my stories, that's just me living life. And, and, you know, sometimes I love that because that's me behind the scenes. That's me being me. Right. So when I'm working, I'm working, when I'm playing, I'm playing. And I'm just a normal guy that I, I love doing the same kind of stuff you probably do. You know what I mean? So. Absolutely. Man, this is awesome. Well, Peter, thank you so much for your time. I cannot tell you how much I appreciate your wisdom and your just the last hour and 15 minutes, man, it's just been an absolute honor. And I hope I get to have you on the show again soon. Any, you know what, anytime. And, and when you do it, you know, do your editing or whatever you're going to do, get me a copy of it. Cause then what I'll do is I'll, I'll dice it up and I'll promote what you're doing. So. Absolutely. 